Hi everybody. Um, so as I said yesterday, we have finished, or as you know, if you listen, we finished um, How to Train Your Dragon. Um, what have we read then? We've read Winnie the Pooh, haven't we? Just Winnie the Pooh and How to Train Your Dragon. Well, I mean, two books already. Um, because this is the third, this is only the third full week of a term. We're charging through them, aren't we? Okay. Um, I do enjoy reading, I suppose, what can be termed classic children's literature. Classic meaning books that have stood the test of time, that have been read for decades and um, and are much loved. Not necessarily read for decades because um, Harry Potter is considered a modern classic. It is decades actually, it's 23 years ago, isn't it? 1997, that was first published. Anyway, somebody could write a book tomorrow and it could sort of become an instant classic. People kind of know this is going to be a book that's going to be read for a long time. This is a classic. Okay, so it was written in 1940, or rather she started writing in 1944, first published in 1944. Written by somebody called um, Astrid Lindgren. Astrid Lindgren. And she's Swedish. She was Swedish. And she created stories about this character Pippi Longstocking for her daughter, <clears throat> who was called Karen. Um, and it was actually her daughter who came up with the name Pippi Longstocking. So set in Sweden, Sweden, which is a Scandinavian country. Okay, chapter one. Pippi moves into Villa Villacula. Villa Villacula. I think I'm saying that right. I don't speak Swedish, so I may be mispronouncing that. On the edge of the tiny little town was an old garden, all overgrown. In this garden was an old house, and in that house lived Pippi Longstocking. She was nine years old, and she lived there all alone. She didn't have a mum or a dad. And that was actually quite nice because there was nobody to tell her to go to bed just when she was having the most fun and nobody to make her take cod liver oil when she would rather eat sweets. I take cod liver oil, but I have it in a tablet, so I don't taste it. Pippi had a dad once and she liked him ever so much. She had a mum too, of course, but that was such a long time ago, she couldn't remember anything about it. Her mum died when Pippi was a tiny, tiny baby who lay in her cot and screamed and screamed so horrendously that no one could go near her. Pippi thought her mum was up in heaven looking down on her little girl through a peephole and Pippi often waved to her up there and said, Don't worry, I'll be all right. Pippi hadn't forgotten her dad. He was a ship's captain and sailed the great oceans and Pippi had sailed with him until the time he blew overboard in a huge storm and disappeared. But Pippi was absolutely certain he would come back one day. She didn't believe that he had drowned at all. She thought he had washed ashore on an island in the South Seas and become the island king and was walking around all day with a golden crown on his head. My mum is an angel and my dad is a South Sea Island king. Not every child has such pe special parents, you know, Pippi always said, <coughs> sounding pleased with herself. And as soon as my dad can build a boat, he'll come and fetch me, and then I'll be a South Sea Island princess. And what a time we'll have. Many years ago, her dad bought the old house that stood in the garden. He had planned to live there with Pippi when he got too old and doddery to sail the oceans any longer. But then, of course, that annoying thing happened when he was blown into the sea. So while she was waiting for him to come back, Pippi went straight home to Villa Villa Coola. That was the name of the house. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. It stood there ready and waiting with furniture and everything. One beautiful summer's evening, she said goodbye to all the shipmates on her dad's boat. They were so fond of Pippi and Pippi was fond of them. Cheerio, lads, Pippi said giving each and every one a kiss on the forehead. Don't worry about me. I'll be all right. 
she took two things with her from the boat. A little monkey called Mr. Nilsson, who was a present from her father, her father, and a big travel bag full of golden coins. The shipmate stood on the deck and watched Pippi walk away until she couldn't see her anymore. She strode on with Mr. Nilsson on her shoulder and the travel bag in her hand and didn't look round once. Hmm, this is a, re a remarkable child, said one of the shipmates, wiping a tear from his eye as Pippi disappeared into the distance. And he was right. Pippi was a very remarkable child. And the most remarkable thing about her was her strength. She was so spectacularly strong that in the whole wide world there was no one as strong as she was. Not even a policeman. She could lift up a whole horse if she wanted to. And she did want to. She had her own horse that she had bought with one of her gold coins the very same day she came home to Villa Villa Coola. She had always longed for a horse of her own and now she had one and he lived on the veranda. But when it was time for Pippi's afternoon coffee, she picked him up and put him in the garden with no problem at all. Next to Villa Villa Coola, there was another garden and another house. <clears throat> in that house lived a dad and a mum with their two sweet little children, a boy and a girl. The boy was called Tommy and the girl was called Annika. They were two very polite and well-behaved and obedient children. Tommy never bit his nails and he always did his mum, did as his mum told him. Annika never argued when she couldn't have her own way and she was always very neat in her well-ironed cotton dresses, which she was careful not to get dirty. Tommy and Annika played very nicely together in their garden, <clears throat> but they often wished for a friend to play with them. And while Pippi was still sailing around on the ocean with her dad, they used to hang over the fence and say to each other, oh, it's stupid that no one ever moves into that house. Someone should be living there. You know, someone with children. On that beautiful summer's evening, when Pippi walked through the door of Villa Villa Coola for the first time, Tommy and Annika weren't at home. They'd gone to stay with their grandma for a week. That's why they had no idea that someone had moved in next door. <clears throat> and the day after they came home and were standing at their gate, looking into the street, they still didn't know that there actually was someone to play with so close by. Just as they were standing there, wondering what to do and whether anything interesting or was going to happen that day or whether it was going to be one of those boring days when there was nothing to do. Just then the gate of Villa Villa Coola opened and a little girl walked out. She was the strangest little girl Tommy and Annika had ever seen. It was Pippi Longstocking going for her morning stroll. This is what she looked like. <clears throat> Her hair was the same colour as a carrot and was in two tight plaits that stuck straight out. Her nose looked exactly like a small potato and was smothered in freckles. Under her nose was an extraordinarily wide mouth full of healthy white teeth. Her dress was quite peculiar. Pippi had sewed it herself. It was supposed to be blue but the blue material had run out, so Pippi had to put red patches here and there. On her long, thin legs, she wore a pair of long stockings, one brown, the other black, and she was also wearing a pair of black shoes that were precisely twice as long as her feet. Pippi's dad had bought them for her in South America, big enough for her to grow into and Pippi wouldn't wear anything else. No, you can see them there. What especially amazed Tommy and Annika was the monkey sitting on the new girl's shoulder. It was a little squirrel monkey dressed in blue trousers and a yellow jacket and a white straw hat. Pippi set off down the street. She walked with one foot on the pavement and the other in the gutter. 
Tommy and Annika stared after her until they couldn't see her anymore. After a while, she came back, and this time she was walking backwards. That was so she didn't have to turn round to walk home. When she reached Tommy and Annika's gate, she stopped. The children looked at each other in silence. At last, Tommy said, Why did you walk backwards? Why I walked backwards, Pippi said. We live in a free country, don't we? Aren't you allowed to walk anywhere you want? Let me tell you what. Let me tell you that in Egypt, every single person walks like that and no one thinks it's strange in the slightest. How do you know? asked Tommy. You've never been to Egypt. Me? Not been to Egypt? <laughs> That's news to me. I've been everywhere in the entire world and seen many strange things that... many much stranger things, sorry, than people walking backwards. I remember. I wonder what you've... Gosh... I don't know what's the matter with me today. Sorry. I wonder what you'd have said if I'd walked on my hands like they do in furthest India. Now you're lying, Tommy said. Pippi thought about that for a moment. Yes, you're right. I am lying, she said sadly. Well, it's bad to tell lies, said Annika, who had at last dared to open her mouth. Yes, it's very bad to tell lies, said Pippi. But... You see, I forget from time to time. And how can anyone expect a little child who has an angel for a mum and a South Sea Island king for a dad and who has sailed around on the sea her whole life to tell the truth all the time? And by the way, she added, the whole of her freckly face beaming. Let me tell you that in the Congo, not one single person tells the truth. They lie all day. They start at seven in the morning and carry on until the sun goes down. So if I happen to lie now and then, you'll have to try and forgive me. And remember, it's because I lived in the Congo for too long. But we can still be friends, can't we? Of course, said Tommy. And he suddenly felt that this was probably not going to be one of those boring days. By the way, why not come and eat breakfast with me? Pippi asked. Well, since you're asking, said Tommy, why not? Come on, let's go. Yes, said Annika, right now. But first, I must introduce you to Mr. Nilsson, Pippi said. The little monkey took off his hat and bowed politely. So they walked through Villa Villacula's garden gate, which was falling to pieces, and up the gravel path lined with ancient trees covered in moss, perfect climbing trees by the look of them, to the house and onto the veranda. There stood the horse, chomping oats, from a soup tureen, <coughs> a big bowl, silver bowl. Why on earth have you got a horse on the veranda? Asked Tommy. A veranda is a covered, a covered platform, a platform that goes around the outside of a house, shaded, which allows you to sit outside um, under cover. Well, said Pippi thinking, He'd only be in the way in the kitchen, and he doesn't like the sitting room. Tommy and Annika patted the horse, and then they carried on into the house. Inside, there was a kitchen, a sitting room, and a bedroom, but it looked as if Pippi had forgotten to do the weekly cleaning. Tommy and Annika looked around nervously in case that South, that South Sea Island king was sitting in a corner. They had never seen a South Sea Island king in all their life, but there was no dad and no mum either. And Annika asked anxiously, Do you live here all alone? Definitely not, said Pippi. Mr Nilsson and the horse live here too. No, I mean, haven't you got a mum or a dad here? No, not at all, said Pippi cheerfully. But who tells you when it's time to go to bed? And, you know, that kind of thing, Annika asked. Well, I do that myself. First... I tell myself once, very nicely, and if I don't obey, I tell myself again, quite crossly, and if I still don't obey, well, then there's trouble, I can tell you. Tommy and Annika didn't really understand this, but thought it might be a good way to go about it. By this time, they had reached the kitchen, and all of a sudden, Pippi yelled, Mixy, mixy, pancake, ixy, bakey, bakey, pancake, makey, take your seaty, pancake, eaty. She took out three eggs and threw them high into the air. One dropped on her head and broke, 
and the egg yolk dripped into her eyes, but she expertly caught all the others in a saucepan where they cracked open. Well, they say egg yolk is good for your hair, Pippi said, wiping her eyes. You watch. It'll come spouting out, sprouting out of my head now. In Brazil, by the way, everyone walks around with egg in their hair. And of course, you never see a bald head anywhere. There was only one man silly enough to eat up all his eggs instead of putting them on his head. And do you know what? Yeah, he went bald, as expected. And whenever he set foot outside, there was such a hullabaloo that the police had to be called for. While she had been speaking, Pippi had very handily scooped all the pieces of eggshell out of the saucepan with her fingers. Then she took a long-handled scrubbing brush, brush from its hook on the wall and began whisking the pancake batter so fast it splashed all over the walls. Finally, she poured what was left into a pancake pan that was heating on the stove. And when the pancake was cooked on one side, she tossed it halfway to the ceiling and caught it in the pan again. And when it was ready, she threw it right across the kitchen and onto a plate that was waiting on the table. Eat, she shouted. Eat before it gets cold. Tommy and Annika and, uh, ate and thought it was a very delicious pancake. Afterwards, Pippi invited them into the sitting room. There was only one piece of furniture in there, an enormous writing bureau, which is a very special desk, which sort of has a... Uh, lots of drawers above it and uh, has a kind of roll top that you can close. It was an enormous bureau with lots and lots of small drawers. Pippi opened the drawers and showed Tommy and Annika all the treasures that she kept inside. There were fantastic bird's eggs and odd looking shells and stones and strings of beads and all sorts of other things that Pippi and her dad had bought on their travels around the world. Pippi gave her new friends a present each, so they would always remember the day. Tommy got a dagger with a shimmering mother of pearl handle, and Annika got a small box with a lid covered in shells. Inside the box lay a ring with a green stone. Why not go home now so you can come back again tomorrow, said Pippi, because unless you go home, you can't come back, you see, and that would be a pity. Annika and Tommy agreed, and so they went home, past the horse that had eaten up all the oats, and through Villa Villacula's garden gate. Mr Nilsson waved his hat as they left. <clears throat> it's sort of interesting, isn't it? When you, when you read a book that's been written, um, you know, yeah, nearly uh, 80 years ago, some of, the, um, some of the decisions the author makes would probably not be made by an author today. So, for instance, the presents that Pippi gives the children. Tommy gets a dagger, which is a knife, and Annika gets a small box with a lid covered in shells. It's very much seen then in those days as a typical present for a boy and a typical present for a girl. But we know it's different nowadays, and um, it could easily be the girl getting the dagger uh, and the boy getting the, 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 um, the box with the, with the shells. But this is 80 years ago. Um, right, OK, so I'm going to stop there, actually. So that was chapter one. Tomorrow, chapter two, Pippi is a thing finder and gets into a fight. All right, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.